If at the time of your 18th birthday your father was the principal owner of the most financially lucrative wrestling promotion on planet Earth, and you grew up in a rather posh section of Connecticut, chances are you'd take it pretty easy, living a life of comfortable luxury. Shane McMahon, as we've seen over the years, has never been an ordinary person, nor is he one to do things the comfortable way. We've seen Shane O'Mac risk life and limb on countless occasions, taking more dangerous leaps and falls than many wrestlers would even fathom performing. Most sons of entertainment promoters and media moguls aren't the type to jump off of two-story steel cages and bleed profusely in street fights. But, as mentioned, Shane is far from ordinary, and he's proven that time and time again. The respect that McMahon earns from fans and wrestlers alike stems from his willingness to be one of the guys, to remain humble and dedicated while pushing himself beyond daunting barriers. Shane has remained a fan favorite from the times we saw him at his most boyishly exuberant to today as he pushes 50, with only his whiter hair being betraying his endless energy. I'm Sam from Cultaholic.com and here are 10 things you didn't know about Shane McMahon. Join us! Number 10. Strong Business Sense Shane's involvement with the family business goes back to his teenage years. As WWE began its development into a national powerhouse in the mid-80s, young Shane worked in his father's merchandise warehouse, sending out wares and promotional items to their customers. But the money that Shane was banking apparently didn't add up to his liking. As the story goes, Shane asked his father for a raise, which Vince refused. While most kids Shane's age would resign themselves to their father's final word after a tantrum or two, Shane, as we've established, did things differently. Instead of sticking around to continue toiling in the warehouse, Shane actually quit the family business. Several days later, school-aged Shane O'Mac found a job working in construction for a cool $400 a week. Was Vince angry at his son's defiant act? Actually, no. Vince was apparently very proud of Shane for not only sticking to his principles, but also getting a better deal for himself. That stubborn but shrewd spirit certainly didn't skip a generation. Number 9. Forbidden Risks Shane McMahon's daredevil mindset has been on full display to WWE. WWE fans for two decades. But his thirst for thrills goes back much earlier than his wrestling days. Childhood friend and Mean Street Posse alumnus Pete Gass has spoken at length about Shane's devil may care attitude and his fearlessness towards such scenarios. But there was apparently one very risky endeavor that Vince did not want Shane to ever take, knowing his attitude toward disregarding safety. That risk? Riding motorcycles. One of their fellow schoolyard chums owned a motorcycle, and the elder McMahon cautioned his son against ever riding it. But one day, Shane did defied his dad and set about riding the bike, albeit away from the front of the McMahon compound. So per Pete Gass's story, Shane's a few blocks up the street whizzing around on the motorcycle when Vince walks out front and asks Pete and the boys where Shane is. Sure enough, Shane comes flying around the block at that very moment, to which Vince orders Shane's friends to leave immediately. As the de facto posse hopped into a car, they could see Vince dragging Shane up to the front door of the house, using his head as a battering ram to open it. And there's a pretty good chance that whatever happened once the two were inside the house was more one-sided than their WrestleMania X7 encounter. Number 8. Official Big beginning. Shane McMahon was an on-screen character long before his time as the Boy Wonder. Years before he would swing his arm and shuffle his feet in his patented taunt, McMahon would appear before television audiences in a muted capacity. On Thanksgiving night 1989 at that year's Survivor Series, the son of the Saturday night's main event lead broadcaster was present throughout the pay-per-view even if most people wouldn't have guessed it. McMahon worked as a referee for the first time at that year's Survivor Series, generally as the outside official whose job it was to shepherd the eliminated wrestlers back toward the dressing room. McMahon also held a similar job at the 1990 Royal Rumble, ushering away the combatants that were thrown out of the titular match. During this time, Shane's name was very rarely mentioned on camera, but he was given the kayfabe moniker of Shane Stevens, to prevent him from being linked to his on-screen patriarch. Number 7. Heating Up Shane would appear very sporadically on WWE programming prior to his introduction as a canonized character. On the famous episode of Raw where Vince accepted Stone Cold Steve Austin's challenge to an official match, Shane popped up as the dutiful voice of reason, but otherwise, you barely ever saw him on camera. That changed forever in August 1998. Sunday Night Heat debuted that month, and with it came the unique announcing team of 20-year-old Shane, alongside veteran manager and creative mind Jim Cornette. Ironically, it was Cornette who played it serious and straight, while Shane was… Shane was something else. If you thought Vince was hyperactive and animated, you haven't seen anything until you've seen Shane McMahon call Sunday Night Heat, in which he sounds as though an IV filled with Red Bull and trucker pills was stationed next to his chair. Shane would also bring out vivacious female accompaniment, playing up to the role of privileged daddy's boy, which may explain his commentary. In character, Shane was grossly unqualified for the job, but nobody, not even Cornette, was going to risk their own job by saying so. Number 6. A 
award-worthy. When Shane stepped into the ring for the first time in 1999, expectations were low. The Attitude Era was more known for sizzle than steak when it came to the in-ring gaga, but McMahon would come to impress fans and critics alike with his ambitious performances. Matches like the ones against X-Pac at WrestleMania 15 and Test at SummerSlam 99 showed the world that this was a man not content to stand solely on ceremony. For his head-turning performances as an unlikely 29-year-old rookie wrestler, McMahon was voted Rookie of the Year by the voters of the long-running publication Pro Wrestling Illustrated. Previous winners had included Steve Austin, Goldberg, The Giant, Owen Hart, Ric Flair, and others, and it did feel a bit strange to see Vince McMahon's only son listed among them. Somewhat famously, however, McMahon humbly refused to accept the award, telling the magazine in regards to the honors, these are for the boys, not me. Which goes to show that even when he's risking his own neck to enthrall audiences, Shane has remained extraordinarily humble. Number five, King of All Media. Older fans will remember WWE's vivid sight on America Online in which you were greeted by a grunty soundbite from Vince McMahon before you went off to argue with fellow fans in all caps in the chat rooms. Simpler times, but WWE understandably had designs on conquering more than just simply AOL, and it was Shane McMahon that helped move that forward. In 1998, Shane helped form the company's digital media department, which he would serve as the head of. That year, WWF.com launched. But few would realize that the now 20-year-old website's launch was spearheaded by the same man who would, in five years, attempt to kill the future mayor of Knox County, Tennessee, as revenge for said future mayor pile-driving his mother, a future US Senate candidate. Man, wrestling is pissing mental. Number four, Unbreakable Boy Wonder. It's the ultimate in car wreck wrestling matches. Shane McMahon versus Kurt Angle at the 2001 King of the Ring. You want to turn away from the brutality, but damn it, you just can't do it. The sequence that turns the most stomachs came when Angle and McMahon fought toward the entrance set, which was equipped with these vertical glass panels. Angle would suplex Shane into the panes, figuring he would break through what was supposed to be brittle sugar glass with ease. Of course, it was anything but easy. The first suplex attempt resulted in not only the glass not breaking, but also Shane bonking his head on the floor with a hideous thud. The second throw sent Shane clean through, but more trouble arose when they reached the second pane. Shane wasn't going through and was by now groggy and and bloody. Angle remembers wanting to move on for the sake of Shane's health, but Shane defiantly and discreetly cursed at Angle, refusing to break from the plans. Angle ended up sending Shane soaring through with a more controlled bouncer's throw. It's to Shane's credit that he demonstrated true grit under painful circumstances, even at the expense of his safety. Number three, money meets money, money, money. When WWE tapped boxing megastar Floyd Mayweather Jr. for a match at WrestleMania 24, they were thinking box office smash. Mayweather's fight with Oscar De La Hoya in 2007 had set a record by doing more than 2 million buys on pay-per-view, and WWE wanted to get both men in the ring come WrestleMania 24. So you're asking me how does Shane McMahon figure into this? Well, he was supposed to be physically involved with the original match. The initial plans were for Shane to team with Mayweather to face De La Hoya and Rey Mysterio. However, De La Hoya turned down WWE's offer, so plans shifted to Mayweather now teaming with Mysterio to take on Shane and Big Show. When Mysterio sustained an injury in early 2008, the match paired down to the Mayweather Show singles battle that we got. Which is a pity because we were robbed of Shane attempting a coast to coast dropkick only for Mysterio to spring up and give him a hurricane rana in midair. Number two, International Innovator. In October 2009, shockwaves were felt when it was announced that Shane McMahon would be leaving WWE effective on January 1st, 2010. His business career would continue outside of the wrestling bubble, as later on in 2010, Shane became the CEO for a company called You On Demand. What was unique about the venture is that it was the first pay-per-view and video on demand service to be offered in the country of China. Shane was initially approached back in 2009 by a company then called China Broadband, which intrigued him enough to become its chairman investing $4 million into the property while also leading to his WWE exit. With Shane as one of the key higher-ups, You On Demand linked up with Warner Brothers in the summer of 2011 with the aim of making the company's movies available to China via the services that You On Demand offered. McMahon would resign as CEO in 2013, but remains vice chairman of the board for the enterprise. And number one, the golden boy. Linda remains the only member of the nuclear McMahon family to have never held a championship in WWE, even though she could probably hold her own against Tommaso Ciampa. 
Champa. Vince has been WWE and ECW champion, Stephanie held the women's title, and Shane kind of sort of ruled the mid-card with brief runs as European and hardcore champion around the turn of the century. Although the European and hardcore belts have each boasted a variety of different performers in their title histories, it's interesting to note that Shane was just the third man to have held each of the belts. Upon his victory over hardcore champion Steve Blackman shortly before SummerSlam 2000, he cinched the second part of what is a very unique distinction. The two wrestlers who pulled off this feat before him were Davey Boy Smith and Perry Saturn. Now how's that for a Motley Trio? And that's our list. I've been Sam from Cultaholic.com. You can follow me on Twitter here. You can follow all of us at Cultaholic. If you like what we do here at Cultaholic, you can check us out on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic. And don't ever forget to hit subscribe and join us.